Thanks, James. Uh, as, as you mentioned, my name is Dr. Connor King. I'm a surgeon here at the center specializing in hip and knee replacement. And we're, James and I are both really excited to both answer questions and also just sort of share a program that we're both really proud of here at the center, particularly with our outpatient hip and knee replacement. So this is just a brief agenda for what we're gonna cover this evening. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about understanding total hip and knee replacement, sort of who needs it, uh, what some of the other options before surgery might be. I'm gonna talk about some of the benefits of outpatient surgery. And then Dr. Hall is gonna to touch on preparing and recovering and, and staying active after joint replacement. And then we're gonna try and allow as much time as we can for questions and answers. As, as Olivia mentioned, we have over 120 people here. And so we're gonna try and get to as many of those questions as we can to, to hopefully make this worthwhile for everyone who's joining us. So arthritis has a huge impact um, as I'm sure many of you who are on this uh, webinar this evening know, it's a leading cause of disability in the United States. There are more than 66 million people who live with arthritis daily, and as many as 23 million people who have it and don't know they have it or are undiagnosed. It's also a growing problem. As our population continues to age, millions and millions more are going to be impacted by arthritis, and this is driven in large part as baby boomers start to age into that bracket over 65, which is when many will then potentially need a hip or knee replacement. By 2030, we expect there to be a continued increase of almost 600% in total knee replacement and 300% in total hip replacement. So it's a growing problem and a growing amount of work for both James and I to, to take care of, to help people like you. So a lot of people maybe don't know exactly what arthritis is. At its most basic uh, core, the definition of it is painful inflammation and stiffness of one or more joints. There are four main types of arthritis, but by far the most common type is osteoarthritis. This is, accounts for probably about 95% of the arthritis that we see. And this is sort of your run of the mill wear and tear arthritis that happens as the cartilage wears out over time. Um, and, and it's unfortunately part of the aging process. There's also post-traumatic arthritis. And so this is arthritis that develops after someone has had some sort of injury, um, be it ligament injury or a fracture, and that can cause damage to the cartilage or to the joint that over time results in accelerated wear and the need for a joint replacement um, earlier than might otherwise be necessary. Inflammatory arthritis is another uh, cause. And so that includes gout, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, and many other autoimmune diseases where the body actually attacks the cartilage. Uh, and then again, also causes uh, wear and tear of the, the, the cartilage um, that necessitating knee replacement or hip replacement. And lastly, and certainly more rare, is septic arthritis. And so this would be an infection of, of the hip or knee joint that then also, through the activation of the knee system, causes destruction of the, the cartilage, which is really the sort of protective layer that allows you to move through your day and do the things that you like without pain. When I see patients and I, and I sort of talk about arthritis, in most cases, we're talking about the osteoarthritis and wear and tear. And I like to sort of equate it to the wear and tear on a tire. You know, the knee starts out with a nice smooth layer of cartilage that over the years through wear and tear or through one of the other causes can sort of wear out and end up bald, like a bald tire. And, and that's not something you want to drive on or walk on or play pickleball on. And that can be pretty painful. And so then that's when we start to, to need other things, potentially surgery, but also a number of options that we can offer before surgery. So when we diagnose arthritis, we talk with the patients, we figure out what their symptoms are, and then we often also get x-rays. And these are some good example x-rays here, starting on the top, but you can see my pointer here with, um, this is a knee x-ray, and this is the thigh bone, the femur, and this is the tibia, the shin bone. And we look at the space between those two bones, and that is where the cartilage is. There's not any calcium in cartilage. And so that's why we can't see it on the x-ray, but we see this space that exists between those two bones and know that the cartilage is still well-preserved there in that space. You can see comparing that with the image over here, this is what we would call, or I'm sure you may have heard bone on bone arthritis. And that's where that cartilage space is gone. And it's really bone grinding on bone. It's sort of a ball tire analogy, and it can be quite painful. Um, Cartilage looks, you know, if you've ever um, cooked chicken or broken down a chicken, um, it's that sort of smooth, glossy white surface. And that's what it normally should look like. And as it wears down, it ends up that there are places where there's none of that and there 
our bone spurs and extra bone and a lot of inflammation and pain. Um, and so that's what this sort of cartoon depicts and, and I think nicely sort of pairs with this x-ray picture up here. Similarly in the hip joint, we always look at the ball and socket joint. And again, looking at that space between the ball and the socket, because that's again where the cartilage is. And as you can see in this image here, when that space wears out, when that nice smooth glossy cartilage surface wears out, then you end up with essentially bone grinding on bone. And that, that can cause a lot of pain and stiffness and, and cause you to come and see either James or myself and see what we can do to help you. There are certainly some great non-surgical options um, that we often start with when we see patients in our clinics. One thing is lower impact exercise, sometimes swimming, water aerobics, using the elliptical. These things put a little bit less stress across the joint, especially if people have more early arthritis. And that can be beneficial because it's a little bit less painful for you to still stay active. Physical therapy can also be helpful for both hips and knees. It can strengthen some of the muscles around the hip or the knee to help stabilize the joint, which can also, again, take some pressure off of that arthritic worn out joint. Weight loss certainly is helpful for similar reasons. It's just less force across the joint. And then assistive devices can be helpful using a cane or walker. Um, but for a lot of people, you know, when they start to get towards having to use these devices and they're not allowed, they're not able to do what they want to want to do, then that's when it, it's often time to think about potentially surgery. There are also some great uh, medications, um, some oral anti-inflammatories like Tylenol, Advil, or Mobic. And these are good at treating the inflammation, which is one of the sort of root causes of the pain. They don't really treat the underlying wear and tear arthritis, but they can, in many cases, when people are just presenting for the first time, still allow them to be active um, and do what they want to do um, until uh, the arthritis sort of progresses a little bit more substantially. I'm sure that many of you have also heard about some of the injection options. They can be steroids, cortisone, corticosteroid, that's sort of all in the same category. And those work very similarly to the anti-inflammatories. They are like taking a strong dose of that medication and putting it right in the joint where the arthritis and inflammation is. And it sort of knocks down the inflammation as a way to treat the, the pain. Again, it's not doing anything for the wear and tear. If someone has any ideas to how to rebuild cartilage or uh, do anything like that, let James and I know, because I think that um, unfortunately there just isn't a lot of great research right now that you know, can regenerate joints. And so steroids are good to sort of help with that inflammation. The lubricating gel can also be helpful to deal with that as it's a synthetic gel that's injected into the joint to create a little bit more cushion um, between those arthritic bones um, to again, help you stay active. The goals of all the non-surgical treatments and of joint replacement surgery is really to allow you to stay active. It's all about quality of life. So this sort of leads into when is it time to consider joint replacement? And really it comes down to, as I mentioned, quality of life. It's pain that stops you from doing everyday things that you want to enjoy, whether that's pickleball, hiking, skiing, anything that Central Oregon has to offer. When you feel like you're not able to do those things and we've tried some of the non-operative options, I think that that's really the time to consider joint replacement. And then it's also, you know, it's not an emergency. It's often sometimes it's something that we work around, but it's a time that's right for you and your family because as, as it, especially with outpatient joint replacement, family support is really of some, some of the utmost importance. And so making sure that you have support around when you're going through the recovery process is really important as well. I'm gonna to touch briefly on just some of the history of joint replacement. Um, I think for a lot of people, this may be a little bit interesting, it's sort of some historical relics. We've come a long way since all of these uh, images here. So this is a, a picture of one of the very first knee replacements. It was a hinged prosthesis. The parts were actually attached together to each other um, and uh, come a long way since then. This is one of the very first hip replacements sort of modern hip replacements. Um, and this is sort of an old hospital ward. You know, it, it used to be that patients would be in the hospital for sometimes up to a week. And so things have really advanced a lot. And I'll touch on some of the things that allowed us to move from the hospital setting to the outpatient setting and really, I think, make it a better experience for patients and their families. Just in terms of the history of hip replacement, the first hip replacement was done in 1981. They tried using ivory, didn't work too well. In 1925, they tried using molded glass, which is shown over here. In the 1940s, they tried using this um, metallic hip replacement. It only replaced the ball. It didn't really do anything to replace the socket. But really, it's still sort of a modern technology. The very first low friction, modern arthroplasty or modern joint replacement for the hip wasn't done until 1962. 
and that's shown here. And it's actually, if you look at this picture, not that different from the parts that we're using nowadays. It's a little bit of some technical differences in terms of how we prepare and, and implant the socket, but um, very similar. And, and as I mentioned, you know, not that long ago, um, it really changed a lot. In terms of knee replacements, it's a similar progression. Um, very first knee replacements are actually done where they try to take some soft tissue and put it in between the bones to try and create some cushioning, which um, didn't do too well. <laughs> Um, as I mentioned, this is one of the first hinged knee replacements. It was done in the 1950s, and these did okay. There's a number of reasons why these don't work that well. And the first sort of modern condylar prosthesis where it sort of replaces the bone in a way that um, is sort of the modern knee replacement wasn't until the 1970s, so even more recent than hip replacement. Um, and really an exciting time um, in the last decade or so as these technologies have continued to advance. Some of the latest advances that I think also allow for outpatient joint replacement and, and just better outcomes for patients. One of the main ones is highly cross-linked polyethylene. So this is actually the plastic surface that goes between the hip bearing surfaces or the knee surfaces. And this is what in the past um, would sometimes wear out over time. And starting in sort of the late 90s, early 2000s, they changed the manufacturing and processing of this plastic to make it much more durable so that now we're seeing parts that last at least 15, 20 years, if not longer. Another major medical advance, which probably doesn't mean a whole lot to, to you, but it means a lot to James and I, is transistemic acid. And this is a medication that helps decrease bleeding during surgery. It used to be common that patients needed blood transfusions after joint replacement surgery, and that is now rare. And I think this medication and also doing more minimally invasive surgeries with um, advanced technology has also helped facilitate us to be able to transition to doing these surgeries on an outpatient basis and also just be safer for patients. Multimodal pain pathways are also really important. This is sort of a buzzword. Some of you may have heard, obviously, there's been a lot of emphasis in the last decade or so on trying to cut down on the exposure to patients of opioids. And these pathways, which include nerve blocks and some other medications, anti-inflammatories, in addition to some but lower doses of narcotics have really helped facilitate a more smooth recovery for patients and a safer recovery for patients as well, which is really important. And then lastly, something that James and I are both very excited about and we have here at the center um, is robotic technology. And this technology allows us to be more precise with how we do our surgeries and put the components in a position that really is patient specific um, and also then do the surgery in a way that is a little bit more friendly to some of the soft tissues, which can make the recovery a little bit smoother as well. So one of the things that robotic technology really allows us to do very nicely is partial knee replacement. And so these are just some pictures of what that sort of looks like. Um, you can basically replace only the inside part of the knee, only the outside part of the knee, or just the patellofemoral joint or the joint underneath the kneecap. And these surgeries are great for people who only have arthritis in, in one part of the knee. And this is just showing sort of what James and I are looking at when we're in the operating room. And we see the individual patient's actual CT scan. So this is what their bone actually looks like. And then we can see where the parts would be going and how the bony resection or, or what bone we'd be taking out would be looking like. And so it really allows us to do surgery in a much more precise way, which is, I think, a great, great thing for patients. In terms of total knee replacement, this is sort of what things look like. I know I showed some pictures before of arthritic bone-on-bone uh, -bone uh, knees. And so this, again, is bone-on-bone -bone arthritis of the knee there. That space that we look for between the bones where the cartilage should be is completely gone. You can see that on this sort of front-facing view and the side view. And then for the knee replacement, the modern knee replacement is sort of more like almost like a resurfacing where we shave off this area of the arthritis here where the cartilage used to be. And we replace that with bony, uh, a metal surface and do the similar uh, shaving sort of of the cartilage on the tibia, the shin bone there, and put in those two metal parts. And then between the two, as you can see here, is this piece of plastic, um, which then on the x-rays shows us sort of, we're recreating that clear space between the bones and that clear space and that plastic is what allows you to then move your knee freely without pain and get back to all the activities that, uh, that you'd like. In terms of robotic knee replacement, it's similar sort of, uh, demonstration of what James and I are looking at. This shows us, again, the patient-specific anatomy in terms of where we'd be removing the bone, but also one of the great things about the robotics is it allows us to take into account the patient's soft tissues. Um, and so that allows us to, to give a knee that is very stable and very functional 
um, to really allow patients to get back to what they love. In terms of total hip replacement, um, this is sort of what that looks like on an x-ray and what the parts look like in a cartoon up here. Um, we basically work to take off the ball part of the, the femur, the thigh bone there. And in the socket, we prepare that area for this acetabular component or this, the socket component. And that goes in sometimes with some screws. Um, ultimately, the bone grows into that part. We then also put a metal part down into the femur called the femoral component. And again, the bone grows into that part as well. And then between the two, there's the femoral head, which is the surface that allows the hip to move freely. And again, that plastic that I, I mentioned before to sort of recreate that space and the surface that allows the hip to move freely and without pain break. I've hit on a couple of these things, but one of the things that we will definitely want to talk about tonight was how joint replacement surgery has changed for you as a patient. In the past, as I, as I mentioned, these surgeries would often require sometimes up to a week in the hospital. Now we're able to do them on an outpatient basis. You're coming into our surgery center, you have the surgery, you're up with therapy shortly afterwards, and then you're able to go home and recover at home afterwards. As I mentioned before as well, the surgeries are now less invasive. Um, and so that allows us to have patients recover a little bit faster. The use of some of those medications and the minimally invasive surgeries allows for blood transfusions to be essentially non-existent now after the knee replacement. Many times in the past, patients would be on bed rest and they weren't encouraged to be active. Now we really want you up and moving. That's why we're doing these joint replacement surgeries and we get you into therapy and, and get you working on strengthening those muscles so you can get back to doing everything that you love. Additionally, it used to be that patients often had general anesthesia, so they were completely asleep. Um, and now we're doing a lot more with nerve blocks and spinal anesthetic, and so that's safer for the patients. It means in many cases you're breathing for your own during surgery, but you have some medications so that you're comfortable and don't feel anything during the surgery, um, but it's a safer experience overall for patients. We've also, as I mentioned, cut down on opioid prescriptions and narcotics, and I think that's really important for patient safety and recovery afterwards. And I think, you know, the, the big take home is that the surgery has changed a lot, um, especially in the last probably 15 or 20 years. And the system that we have here that James is gonna talk a little bit more about in terms of the outpatient program, is really something that I think is a huge benefit to all of Central Oregon. Um, it's something that we're both really excited to be a part of. Obviously, 2020 was a crazy year and 2021 is shaping up to be more of the same. Um, and as we know, there's been some intermittent cancellations of surgeries and there's a huge backlog that's expected for both orthopedic spine for replacement surgeries uh, that may take us up to two years to, to work through. And that's one of the other benefits of doing outpatient surgery is that we are no longer at the whim of what's going on in the hospital and we can, um, in the right patients, uh, do the continue to operate, continue to do the surgeries and get people the things that they need. So we're, we're happy about that. The program began in 2016 and continues to grow and expand. And it was driven and continues to be driven by a desire to optimize really the best care for patients. Our goal is keeping the patients out of the hospital. Hospitals are places where things can happen in terms of infection and and other things, and we really want to try and keep people out of the hospital and get people home. We want to emphasize this enhanced recovery after surgery, multimodal pain control using the nerve blocks and different medications at the time of surgery and after surgery. It's also a huge cost savings to the healthcare system, and so we feel that a responsibility to um, help the healthcare system by doing these surgeries on an outpatient basis and in a way that's safe. And I think that really underlies the whole program is the emphasis on patient safety. Um, and I think that if anyone has questions about that, um, we're happy to answer those. But that really is, I think, at the core of all of this. And again, it's delivering what we think is, is the best care for patients. In terms of patient safety, there's been a lot of research um, looking at that. And there's some great research articles showing that outpatient replacement does not increase the rate of complications after surgery. And also that patients who have undergo outpatient replacement actually and tend to have higher rates of satisfaction. As I mentioned, hospitals are places where you're woken up at odd hours, the beds are uncomfortable, um, you're not at home, it can be sort of disorienting, discombobulating. And so even the lay press uh, here in the New York Times is, is saying that after hip and knee replacement, there's, there's no place like home to recover. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to James here um, so we can talk a little bit more about uh, the outpatient program here at the center. Thank you, Connor. Um, 
we're going to uh, change uh, directions. And as uh, Connor had just talked to you about, we're going to focus more on um, the actual experience that you have as an outpatient um, in our center at uh, in our surgery center. Um, bear with me as we get this presentation started. All right. Um, outpatient joint placement surgery at the center. As Dr. King had uh, started to say, we started in uh, actually early 2015 um, doing our first cases and working through a lot of the early um, misconceptions and um, generating protocols to make it a safe and wonder wonderful experience. So we're really proud, as um, Dr. King had mentioned, of the time and uh, the uh, extensive staff that we have here that have really worked to make this an experience um, that has been very positive uh, throughout the years. Um, as Dr. King uh, started to say, it, it definitely allows you to stay out of the hospital um, and to recover in your home, which is a lot of times a lot nicer. Hospital settings can be busy. Um, there are sick patients in the hospital and sometimes infections and other complications can be higher in that setting. Um, it's actually the same procedure that we do in the hospital we're doing in our surgery center. We're using the same technology, if not more advanced in the surgery center to include robotic, uh, computer assisted, um, all these we have at our uh, resources. Um, hip replacements, knee replacements, uh, we're doing on a regular basis. Um, we started out in 2016 under about 30 cases uh, per year. Now we're over uh, 200 cases uh, per year. Um, we have lots of surgeons, including myself and Dr. King uh, that specialize in joint replacements also participating in this uh, replacement. Um, computer assisted um, navigation as well as robotically assisted, which is the newest technology, which really allows us to uh, get an accurate knee replacement, sometimes decreases your overall operative time. Um, it does not necessarily um, decrease your uh, longevity of your, um, oh. sorry, hold on, technical difficulties. Um, allows you to, uh, back to the robotic surgery, allows you to, doesn't allow you to get better quicker, but it does allow you to have more accurate component placement and sometimes a shorter surgical time, which in the long run can assist with your overall recovery. Um, we have a great team. Our team has grown in our surgery center to include nurses, anesthesiologists, um, the physical therapist and our administrators that get you through in a safe way um, through this entire uh, process. The nursing is outstanding and it's a one-on-one -on -one nurse where um, you're catered to. Um, you're usually with us only about three, four hours after your surgery, depending on um, your recovery phase. Um, you have an a personalized physical therapist that comes work with you. It's not necessarily the therapist that would work with you afterwards in an outpatient setting. It can be, um, but this is uh, the therapist that works with us from Therapeutic Associates. Um, getting up is an important part, as Dr. King had mentioned earlier. Um, we get you up within an hour of surgery. You're walking with a walker usually. Um, and you're taking a couple steps. We don't want you to overdo the walking, overdo the activity. And we can talk about that more um, on one-on-one -on -one basis, but um, it's important to be able to navigate to uh, different areas in your house in terms of um, going to the bathroom, eating meals. Um, that's all a big part of uh, what we'd like to see before you leave. Um, 
common questions, does your insurance cover this procedure? And at this point, majority of insurances, including Medicare, do cover this procedure in an outpatient basis. There's a very few and small group of um, insurance providers that have not uh, gone on board with joint replacement surgery in an outpatient setting. But for the most part, majority of uh, insurance companies do cover this. Um, and the next question, can anyone undergo outpatient surgery at our center? And the, the, the real answer is it's not for everyone. Um, we do have a very rigorous process that you're evaluated with an anesthesiologist um, to determine if there's medical um, ongoing issues that we need to solve before um, your elective surgery. Um, and what are the requirements to consider? Well, number one, uh, motivated patients. This is, um, you, wanna, you wanna get better sooner, and that's why we're doing the surgery. We're, we're trying to get you back, as Dr. King had mentioned, to those things that you really love to do um, here in Central Oregon. Um, active, independent people, um, healthy. Um, we are allowing uh, more medical problems uh, based on the fact that they're stable. Um, and the most important thing is to have somebody that's close to you. It doesn't have to be a spouse. It can be a, a friend. And we call that a coach. And the coach is a really important um, and necessary partnership that allows you to get better quicker. And your coach is a big part of your recovery after surgery in our center. Um, they're there with you when you do physical therapy. Um, and they'll be able to transfer any of that information to you if you don't remember um, because of any medications that you receive, but they're there also to watch you and to help you out. They do not have to be um, medically trained. Um, we fill them in on a lot of the details um, as you need to go uh, through this. The other thing is um, we also have joint replacement class available um, even uh, through uh, web and uh, non-in-person methods. And these are classes that we like to see you attend. It really gives you an idea on what to expect after surgery and just before surgery. Um, so this is a little different than this lecture series um, tonight. Um, so the joint replacement class is um, a very important step to really obtain more information to be better um, better in terms of knowing what to expect afterwards. Um, our surgical techniques, Dr. Con, uh, Dr. King had mentioned um, different techniques. We're doing minimally invasive techniques, um, robotically assisted in our surgery center. Um, anesthesia, um, we have a wonderful group of anesthesiologists that are there just to make you comfortable and keep you safe. Um, we use regional blocks as much as possible. So therefore we do minimize the pain, um, discomfort after surgery as much as possible. Um, and this does decrease the need for narcotics um, for the most part. Um, there's still relatively sore procedures and um, we hope that we've eliminated the, um, the horror stories that people have about severe pain uh, related to joint replacement surgeries. And most importantly, you don't need to stay in the hospital for multiple days um, as was before. Years ago, we used to have people even admitted the day before surgery and um, keep them comfortable and talk to them more about their surgical intervention. Nowadays, it's less likely that we can do that in our hospital situation and settings. So it's nice that we can um, take care of some of these questions in our joint replacement class preoperatively, as well as with our teams um, in the clinic. Our infection rates can be uh, and are usually less than in larger medical centers. Um, we work very hard at keeping infection rates uh, low, including maximizing your overall health before uh, surgery. And there are some uh, limitations in terms of what we can allow in our surgery center based on anesthesia criteria. Um, there used to be an age criterion. Um, now um, with uh, support and family assist, we don't really have a significant age cutoff. We've 
um, worked on folks in their 80s. Um, and as long as health and, and overall um, medical um, problems are a minimum, it's uh, usually something that we can work out. Um, lower price um, for insurance carriers, this is a, a, a cheaper procedure in outpatient settings. So we're trying to keep the cost down in the community as well as with our insurance carriers. And, and thus far, I think that has worked uh, substantially. So most of our insurance carriers appreciate uh, doing this. Um, patient satisfaction scores are, are really high. I, it makes a big difference when uh, people can recover in their own setting, in their own environment. We're always available for questions. We have nurses that contact you after surgery, the day after it, and we as physicians um, are always um, welcome with our medical assistants to answer and assist with any questions you have um, before or after. Um, Uh, so once again, just to, to recap, um, it's a nice setting where it's a more one-on-one -on -one, uh, relationship with your nurse as well as physical therapist and the rest of our team, um, which can make a wonderful experience for you um, as we go through things. Um, now, um, I think um, we'd like to open it up to questions uh, from um, you at home. Um, Hopefully we can answer as many as possible. Some may be individualized where we have to um, offline uh, address them, but for the most part, um, we'd like to entertain some questions. James, there's a question on cementing versus uncementing um, for knees. So I don't know if you want to yeah. chat about that. Yeah, um, you know, like everything else in medicine, I think we go through um, evolutionary um, sort of loops. And I think probably about 15 years ago, uh, non-cemented knee replacements um, it came about. I think early on, the results weren't as good as with cemented. So the, the gold standard for years and years was cementing uh, knee replacements. Now um, with better metals, better components, uh, better techniques, um, based on bone stock, age, um, we are using more and more non-cemented uh, knee replacements. Hips and um, haven't been cemented on a routine basis for years now, um, which is really nice, but knees have just caught up with that. There's a question about issues with range of motion after surgery in regards to golf and skiing. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I think that the reason why James and I do these surgeries is to be able to let people continue to golf and ski. Um, sometimes you can develop some stiffness after, more so after knee replacement than hip replacement. Um, and so those sort of weeks two to six are really critical working with the therapist to work on that range of motion. Um, and so I think that sort of hits on some other questions as to how long therapy is. Most people by about six weeks, if they're doing okay, sort of graduate out of therapy, but it depends a little bit on each individual patient as to whether sometimes they need a little bit more guidance going forward. Um, another question was asked about um, anticoagulants, so blood thinners before and after surgery. Yeah. Um, James and I, for the most part, um, in patients who have no history of bleeding disorders or blood clots, we treat people with just a baby aspirin twice a day. There's been a lot of research that's shown that that's safe and effective um, at preventing blood clots, and as long as those patients don't have any history of previous blood clots or clotting disorders. How about I can address, uh, there's a question about what are your metal allergies approach? Um, and this is a, uh, a question that, that comes up uh, since we are using metals in the body. For the most part, our knee replacements are made out of cobalt and chromium. Um, they do have some nickel uh, metal in them. There are what I call hypoallergenic uh, components that contain less nickel. Um, and this is important uh, to let us know 
ahead of time, if you do have a significant allergy to say nickel or other metals that you've had uh, encountered in your body, um, this is not 100% science, but it's a very rare uh, condition where you have a rejection to your metallic um, joint replacements. Someone asked specifically about if they would be asleep during surgery besides the spinal. <laughs> but <laughs> our anesthesiology team here is great. Um, it's the same anesthesiologists that work here in St. Charles, and um, they really are good at taking care of each individual patient. So some patients who maybe are a little bit more anxious um, maybe do need to go to sleep. But I think for most patients, um, doing spinal anesthetic with medication similar to what you get if you've had a colonoscopy, where you're sort of out of it um, and comfortable, um, I think is a, is a really good option. But some people do need to go to sleep. Um, there is a question that's, um, uh, what type of things keep patients from getting outpatient surgeries? Um, I think that's a really good question. It's, a, it's on an individual basis. Um, there's a group of uh, folks that um, this is not the right setting for them if they are very anxious about um, surgery in general. Um, sometimes um, other medical conditions, if they're, if you have a very um, significant sleep apnea, um, sometimes uh, working with our anesthesiologist, uh, we feel that it may be best um, to have that done in a hospital setting. Um, but once again, um, on an individual basis, we look at you and uh, try to evaluate and make sure that uh, you can uh, safely undergo the procedure um, as an outpatient. There was a question about single knee replacement versus bilateral knee replacement. Um, I think James and I feel similarly about this. Um, you know, there are certainly some people that do bilateral knee replacement. Um, the, there is some good research that shows that that increases the risk profile, sort of doubles it in some ways. And so doing two surgeries at once um, if something does not go as anticipated and there is a complication um, that can recover from or tough to manage. And so I think we both feel that we'd rather do one at a time, make sure that you get through the recovery um, before proceeding with the second one. Um, one of the questions is, uh, what if you do not have support locally um, as somebody did maybe for their first knee replacement. Um, and uh, as we mentioned, the coach is a, a very big part of um, getting through the process as an outpatient. It doesn't have to be um, a family member or a spouse, but a close friend. Um, some people have a network, um, either fellow pickleball players or um, other folks in their church or or somewhere where you can have that assistance. But right now um, in this community, there's not really a um, insurance covered um, mechanism to help you at home. There are private organizations that can arrange to have nursing at home um, that are outside the costs of insurance carriers. Um, so that was a very good question. So I'm going to ask a follow-up about waiting for the second year replacement. I usually tell people I want to wait at least six weeks, James. What are you, six weeks? Yeah, weeks? I say six, six weeks. I mean, you know, if it really kills you and you're, you're just miserable, then I think we all make exceptions. But six weeks is usually, I think, uh, the very minimum. It's not uncommon that, you know, um, after the first couple of weeks that you say, there's no way that I'm going to have my other knee replaced. And I think that's a very common um, uh, thing that we hear from patients. And, and I think that we respect that. Um, but as time goes on, two, three months go by, you, you realize that you are moving around more, you're doing more, you're interacting more, and your opposite knee uh, that may be affected or your opposite hip um, with advanced arthritis is slowing you down. So um, yeah, I, I say the same, at least six weeks. Another question about um, how long you wait from another surgery. Um, 
on another part of the body, not a joint replacement. I, I usually tell people, again, at least six weeks, but probably maybe depending on the surgery, up to three months, depending on exactly what it was. It's a little bit case by case, I think. Yeah, I agree. Totally. Totally. Um, there's a question, how long after surgery can you walk without a walker? Um, and I think that's an individual case. We, we always want you to be safe um, and to have muscle strength and coordination uh, to catch yourself if you stumble. And that's a big part. So initially, a walker usually is um, one of the first steps, sometimes transition to crutches if that's applicable or to a cane as soon as possible. So that's on a case by case basis. Usually I would say probably a couple weeks um, nowadays that most people are sticking uh, with a walker. Would you agree, Connor? Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Um, someone asked about whether they get staples or stitches. <laughs> um, and I think in most cases now, James and I are using dissolvable stitches a little bit dependent on each individual patient, but I think that's what we do most of the time. And then a more specific question about the pain medication that they get afterwards. Um, it is again, gets back to sort of that multimodal pain pathway. So everyone will be on Tylenol and then in some cases, another anti-inflammatory, they get a small uh, prescription of usually um, oxycodone and then sometimes also potentially tramadol, which are both stronger types of pain medications. And then um, occasionally for some people, we do give a very small prescription of a longer acting narcotic to help get through those first couple of days. Um, everyone's a little bit different um, in terms of what the surgeon prescribes and patients sometimes have pre-existing pain tolerances. And so then that can sometimes vary those prescriptions a little bit as well. And um, see, there's a couple of questions about activity after joint replacements. And I, I think it's, it's fair to say that over the years, we've really changed our mindset in what we allow folks to do on a permanent basis and what we don't. Um, years ago, it was, you know, you just walk to the mailbox and, and you're happy. Now we have folks that are getting back to um, skiing, downhill cross country, pickleball, tennis, um, hiking extensively, backpacking, kayaking, horseback riding, golfing. Um, the one thing I think that I still um, are, are not super excited is jogging or running after knee or hip replacement. And uh, um, Connor, you can talk about your experiences. It just does wear down your components sooner. And we don't wanna see you back in five years um, with something that could possibly last 20 uh, plus years. So. For the most part, running, jumping, um, bouldering, not a great idea. Jumping off of vehicles on a regular basis, not a good idea. But um, I think we can both say that over time, your function is pretty much near normal with those exceptions. I used to say also, the other thing that's tough to get back into is yoga. Um, modified yoga, I think, is exceptional and, and understandable. but. Um, Full yoga, the twists, the contortions, sometimes is a little much, uh, even for our modern day um, knee and hip replacements. There are a couple questions about um, anterior versus posterior hip replacement. Um, so for those who uh, aren't familiar with that, it basically means whether you sort of come to the hip from the front or come to the hip from the back. Um, and I think that if you look at the current literature, the sort of high quality literature, it would suggest that at about a year um, or, or at a year when you look at it, patients are equivalent regardless of how the surgery was done. If there is any benefit, it may be marginal and it's really in sort of those first six weeks and it seems to potentially maybe favor anterior just because of that approach. That said, when you talk about minimally invasive posterior approaches, I really think that it's sort of a little bit surgeon preference um, and, and I don't know that there's really a substantial benefit per se um, for one versus the other. Um, I know that James does does posterior. I do sort of both, um, but I think both are great options depending on the patient. Um, there is a question um, and I'll, I'll read it. Bend is a smaller town. 
how do outcomes from your center compare to outpatient centers in larger population areas? Um, we've actually looked at our patient um, results as well as satisfaction, and um, we are at or better than some of the larger uh, cities with overall patient satisfaction um, and uh, outcomes with uh, very low complication rate. We work extremely hard um, with all of our staff and yourselves to decrease any perioperative infections or um, complications, but those numbers aren't zero, um, but they're usually in the very low 1% or less than 1%, which is way better than the national average. Um, so we definitely, um, Ben might be a smaller town, but we have medical resources that are definitely can exceed some of the larger um, even cities um, around us. Someone just asked about how long hip and knee replacements last. Um, I generally, I tell people that they last at least 15 to 20 years. Um, I think that if you look at some of the longer registry data, you can maybe say a simple way is to say that about 1% of joint replacements may require revision every year after the surgery. So that means that at 15 years, 85% of joints are still doing great, but maybe there's a subset that have required revision. That said, with the advances in robotic technology and then plastic, but highly crossing polyethylene, we really don't have 20 years of data yet. And so I think that the data will continue to improve and, and you know, in five or 10 years, we may be able to say that they're lasting even longer. The way you tell patients, James, <laughs> similar. Very similar, yes, yeah, very similar. Um, there's a question, um, can you address the COVID vaccine status and the status that might affect outpatient surgery? Um, at this time, you do not have to be vaccinated um, for COVID to have surgery in outpatient setting. Um, as with all outpatients across the country, um, as well as the hospital here in Bend, you do need to have a COVID test negative prior to your surgical intervention. Um, at this point. Um, so uh, the COVID vaccine status does not, um, the lack of the COVID vaccine status does not prevent you from having surgery in our outpatient setting. How about uh, the question, should we expect a long wait time to be evaluated and to be scheduled for surgery? Um, it varies. Um, and, I, and uh, for the most part, I think um, between myself and Dr. King um, and some of the other providers, we can get you in in a timely manner. Um, the, the fact that uh, we do have a number of folks that may have planned to have surgery at the hospital and now qualify as an outpatient um, because of the slowdown, uh, because of COVID and other reasons at the hospital, I think that that has pushed us back a little bit, um, but we don't want you to get discouraged. Um, myself and Dr. King are, are here for you and we want you to get better sooner. And as soon as it's safe and we have the time, we definitely can push to have you uh, in to have surgery. Someone asked about how long until they can drive after surgery. Um, I think this depends a little bit on a couple of factors. So one, whether it's the right leg that's operated on, so that can obviously as the gas brake pedal leg sort of slow things down a little bit. Also, you need to be off of any of the strong narcotic pain medications. For most people that ends up being, depending on its hip or knee, somewhere three to four weeks. And then I always tell people to try in the neighborhood first, make sure that they can get around safely. Their reaction time's fine. They are okay slamming on the brakes um, and not having anything crazy happen. Um, so it's, it depends a little bit patient to patient. Um, there's also a lot of questions about physical therapy uh, around uh, surgery. Um, I think both of us uh, do uh, push therapy even for hips as well as knees. Um, it's a big part of your recovery and um, it's nice to work with. Uh, we have uh, 
lots of talented physical therapists in Central Oregon and in the region surrounding um, that know us and uh, work closely with us. And we're in communication with the therapist at all times, but it's, I, I think you'll agree, uh, Connor, it's a big part of recovery um, and getting you back to the things you love to do um, in the community. Someone asked about whether they can get a steroid shot in the bad knee while they're having the first knee surgery. And I think that's fine. That's something I think James and I both do periodically um, to help sort of expedite the recovery of the, the surgical knee. Um, back to physical therapy, um, the question is how many appointments potentially, and that varies uh, from uh, case to case. I think on average, probably three to four weeks, uh, would you say, Connor, is, is probably about right. Um, yeah. and, and a lot of times, sometimes it's needed longer, and um, we like to, to, to find a therapist that works great with you and um, make that a good relationship too. Pain pumps uh, was brought up by someone. That's something that I think was used in the past. Um, with, with how we do everything now, sort of the multimodal pathways and also the blocks that we do with anesthesia at the time of surgery, meaning with an ultrasound, they put numbing medicine around some of the nerves. Uh, we're not using any of the pain pumps. Um, I think that it hasn't been shown that those really make anything any better. Um, and when we can control the pain using other modalities, I think that's better for patients. Um, there's also a question, um, I am in my 70s, um, is it better to have surgery earlier than later um, based on age? Um, I think now, as Connor had mentioned in his lecture, it's a quality of life, um, and we really look at, are you able to interact in, the, in, in your community? Are you, are you able to do the things that you love within reason, of course, um, and age um, we like to think as a number. Um, we like to look at your overall health and your motivation and your ability to, to um, safely go through the procedure. So I always tell folks, you know, um, none of us getting any younger. We want to interact and we want to do it at the time that's right for us. And if the time is right and your health is good, but your joints are really slowing you down, preventing you from staying active and maintaining your health, then it's probably a good idea to push doing it and not waiting into your mid eighties, um, which is sometimes a tougher recovery. I usually tell people to wait about six weeks to fly after surgery. Is that what? Depends. Yeah, I think I think I, I think it, it also depends on why you're flying out of town. Sure. Um, some folks, you know, you have to leave for whatever reason, family emergency, um, weddings, first birth of grandchildren or children. Um, I think that's important, but I think for the most part, as long as you can wait to do a vacation, I think you might appreciate it better. Um, maybe after two months. And I think um, in the past, we've said at least two months for air travel, but you know, with quicker flights and, and better anticoagulant modalities, I think uh, we're changing our mindset. A new question, which I guess is maybe more relevant now, is people are asking when they can get their COVID booster after surgery mm -hmm. or before surgery. Um, I don't think that there are, for me, any limits of it before surgery. After surgery, I might tell them to wait a week or two, just because I know sometimes with those boosters, they can cause some sort of systemic symptoms that um, would be potentially worrisome for us as to whether the joint itself is infected. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, James. Yeah, pretty much the same. Um, I think it's important to to make sure you're you're feeling good before the surgery and if you have any uh, residual effects and that goes with the flu shot i think in other um, shots that we're getting nowadays um, there's a question about the coach and how long through the recovery process does that person need to be committed uh, to be involved directly um, weeks perhaps and and the real answer is, um, I think that is another individual 
Um, we do have a requirement uh, for the first 72 hours. We'd like somebody to be with you or around you on a regular basis. Um, but if there's other folks, different family members that can assist you getting to therapy, um, we do have access to home health physical therapy, but they don't have on a regular basis all the modalities that you have as an outpatient. Um, so driving is limited initially um, for your safety and the safety of others. Um, but um, I think a coach is needed at least for the first, I'd say at least 72 hours, maybe even up to a week. Um, Uh, a couple questions we haven't covered on dental work and antibiotics afterwards. Um, we do still recommend that uh, as prophylaxis to help prevent infection of the joint replacement. So we're always happy to write prescriptions for that uh, if you need it. I think we might have time for, I don't know, we're running out of time, but. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions. There are a lot of people here and we tried to get to as many as we could. Um, I don't think there's any. I, no, think, we, I, think, we, yeah. I think we covered all of them. Yeah, yeah. So thanks to everyone for attending. Um, it was a pleasure for James and I to meet all of you virtually. <laughs> Um, hopefully we can do one of these in person at some point in the not too distant future. And I, I agree with Connor. It's, it's been a pleasure um, uh, talking and hopefully answering a majority of your questions. Um, myself and Dr. King are here for you and uh, we're trying to make this a wonderful experience for you and your coach or your family members. So thank you for your time.